Today's sales leaders face a difficult task, selling the right products at the right time through the right channels. A new three-day program from Harvard Business School Executive Education addresses this problem directly. Join us on the Boston campus in August for Managing Sales Teams and Distribution Channels, where you will discover strategies that can lead to the best sales performance. Learn more by clicking the banner or visiting hbs.me slash sales. That's hbs.me slash sales. Blog Talk Radio. <clears throat> Welcome to the War Room. We got Ted, Aaron Kim, Jimmy, PJ, B. Austin, the Hot Block Commander. How you want to end up one or two hour show to keep the brain running with the premise of talk sports on a national level. Both with the topics, sort of like the rubber. When it's game time, they like the fad five during prime time. Sports conglomerates speak their minds a little bit. For sports medicine and sports veterans and greats. The 4 for 26, so the war ain't can wait. It's the war room with five nights at the round table. Five silly guys diversified and educated. What up, what up, what up, War Room family? You are once again live in the War Room, brought to you by War Room Sports on the War Room Sports Podcast Network. I'm one of your hosts. I'm Dev McMillan, and I'm here with my brother. We got Jimmy the Blueprint in the building. Uh, the NBA playoffs are now in round two. The NFL draft is history. But, of course, the homie Fred Purdue is with us. He's going to join us to critique what happened, at least on paper. You know, nobody's gotten on the field yet, but you know how we do. So settle in, keep it locked right here, and get in on. And if you want to get in on the conversations, make sure you join us right now in the JW Philly Realty chat room at blogtalkradio.com slash the war room, or join us on Facebook or Twitter at War Room Sports. You can also call us directly in about 15 minutes after Fred's segment when we open up the Digital Extreme Tech Hotline. Uh, at that time, you can get anything off your chest <laughs> from the week of sports. That, that's your time to do it right after uh, Fred's segment. So, look, that number as usual, 323-410-0012. One last thing before we get things popping, make sure that during the week when we're not live on the air, we check out archive episodes of our show at warroomsports.com, the War Room Sports mobile app, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, uh, Google Home, wherever you listen to podcasts, we're most likely there. What up, fellas? Hey, Jimmy and, and Fred, you know, I got to let y'all know, this war room sports lifestyle is a choice. <laughs> Always remember that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, you know, it's about free thought. Yeah. Hey, hey, Fred Purdue. Hey, Fred Purdue, you there? Yeah, I'm here. What's going on, guys? How y'all doing? Ain't nothing, man. Ain't nothing, man. Fred, are you, you having trouble with Fred, Jimmy? Yeah, I got to throw the flag on you, Jimmy, man. You look, you're sounding like you yeah, you sound real, real bad right now, man. It sounds like they're trying to beam you up and, and take you away, man. It's you sound like you're testing oh, terrible, the water. <laughs> yeah. All right, I might have to, I might have need, to hit back in, man. We need some, um, <laughs> we need some new sponsors so we can get some some new equipment so we can leave these sites alone. <laughs> no shots, no shots, blog talk, but you know we gotta do what we gotta do. Um, so, so look, man, I mean, it's been a wild week, sports, outside of sports, y'all man, Kanye is tripping, we're going to talk about that a little later, when we talk about what happened while everybody was on the grind, you know, I just found out this week that slavery was a choice, um, we could have opted out, all I'm we had to do was go see. I'm, I'm still negotiating my contract. Yo, yo, can y'all so hear you, me? You, you've been talking to human resources, trying to, trying to hey, get your opt out. I'm, try, I'm trying to get that clip. I'm trying to get that player option, bro. I'm trying to get that player option. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Yo, that, that sound any, do that down. sound any better or it sound the same? It, it's a little better. It's just a little muffled compared little to you. It's a little but better, man. Before, I, I put it, like, it sounded like you were scuba like diving while you was doing the show. I take you in the third round, but you, you, you working your way up. Yo, it ain't me, yo. It's blog talk. Blog, blog talk is trash. But yo, listen, um, <laughs> yo, <laughs> yo, uh, he, he took you in the third Fred, round, so you didn't, you made it up to running back status, Jim. I know he just he, disres- <laughs> he disrespected me, man. But let me tell you about this boy Fred Purdue, man. So, so, so Fred Purdue, Fred Purdue, uh, game two uh-oh, of the Cavs uh-oh. and 
Raptors while we're on the air because tip off happens in just a few seconds from now. My bad, Jim. Yo, my man, my, my man Fred Purdue didn't like the fact that we clowned him about not wanting the uh, Greek freak. So as uh, Milwaukee was getting uh, kicked out of the playoffs by Keith Murray and them, Fred gonna hit me <laughs> talking about. See, he lost. I'm like, yo. Uh, oh yo, man, he was on, gonna man. lose at some point. The Bucks weren't going to the finals, dog. <laughs> I'm like, come on, man. We didn't say I'm that. Like, come on, Fred. Like. Yo, Fred, Fred your, your Greek freak slander is terrible, man. I mean, I don't know what's worse, you slandering Greek freak or Teddy Bridgewater. Um, never mind. I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> mm. The light mm. up, man. <laughs> the light or, Jay, up, man. Or, or, or Jay Cutler. Never mind. I'm just going to be quiet, man. Yo, <laughs> yo, yo. Demo. I can make a few mistakes. I can make a few mistakes. Fred, like, look, man, players fuck up. <laughs> 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 I can take you a couple of know. JR3s. I can take a couple bad JR3s, man. Give, give, me a break. give me a break. It's all good, though. I'm telling you, man. You, you, when, when Greek Freak end up in Miami, you're going to be happy or happy? No, mm-hmm. definitely you're not. Gonna be, definitely you're going to change the name to Beach Freak. You're going to be down there. Y'all going to be loving it. All right, so look, man. Let's get into these hot topics because the hottest topic that we're going to talk about is the NFL draft recap. You know, Fred is going to do his thing. You know how we feel here about people, you know, recapping drafts right after they happen. You know, nobody gets to play. So we really don't know who made what. But we can always look, see who did what on paper. We're going to talk about some perceived winners and losers from the draft. So basically, winners and Cleveland um, should be the segment because that's what it is every year, winners and Cleveland. Um, And then we're going to get Fred's opinion on some way too early top five picks for next year's draft. So before we do that, let me pay this bill real quick. Hot Topics are brought to you by my bookie. What up out there, family? Let's talk turkey for a minute and, and, and how much of it you can win. Betting on sports contests at my bookie. NBA and NHL playoffs are here, so if you haven't checked them out yet, it's a great time to do that. Lay down some money on the biggest games in sports. Join us. And loads of other online players investing at mybookie.ag. That's mybookie.ag. If you're tired of getting a runaround when it's time for a payout, we urge you to join my bookie. No hassle. You win. They pay fast without any of that crazy stuff. You're wasting your time betting anywhere else. They even have in-game live betting that, to this day, we still don't understand. But you can place bets after tip-off, kickoff, face-off, whatever you're watching. Join now, and my bookie will match your first deposit with a 50% bonus. Just use the promo code WARROOM, all caps, to activate this offer. Visit mybookie.ag today. Play, win, and get paid, period. All right, so we're going to get into this draft talk. So, Fred, it, it was an interesting few days. I mean, you know, even though we – yeah, we do the, the NFL show that's been on hiatus for, for a while from the network. Um, I, I'm, I've i never been, like, a huge NFL draft dude. Like, I really can't sit around a whole weekend stuck in front of the TV watching, you know, two-minute highlights and names and scrolls and tickers and all that kind of stuff. But I understand this is your wheelhouse. So I'm pretty sure I know what you did all last weekend. Give us some winners and losers from this weekend, this past weekend's draft. And then, you know, anything that we want to add or maybe ask, we'll just throw it in there as you go. Well, for me, uh, when you talk about winners, uh, I look at a, I look at, we'll start, we'll start very easy to, these New England Patriots, every time you find a way. Nah, and, and I know you're going to kill me for it. You're going to kill me for <laughs> it. But, this guy. But, 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 Fred, but, you can at least hear me like, out. try <laughs> to disguise it sometimes and start with somebody else. <laughs> but no, go ahead. Hear me out. Just, just hear me out. Just hear me out. Every time this this the dynasty keeps saying, everyone keeps saying the dynasty's over and things are going to change. Bill Belichick finds a way to pick a player you've never heard of or you don't expect to – uh, to make this team, and and again he attacks needs, not wants. Needs. Offensive line was a need. We hear at War Room Sports, what do we say? Fat people win championships, right? Well, you have a mm-hmm. glaring need at left tackle, you got a glaring need at right tackle, and you got a need at guard. So you go get Isaiah Wynn from Georgia. He fits all three spots. 
left tackle, right tackle, or guard. Undersized tackle at that, but nonetheless. And then you were going to attack. And I didn't like the move and as much as I talk about running back. I didn't necessarily like the move. Um, they went out and attacked the running back position to replace Deion Lewis with a, with a, uh, a familiar face in Sony Michelle. He fits the position for them, their needs. Fine with me. Uh, they attacked other positions like corner. They needed it with Malcolm Butler um, being – Moving on to the Tennessee Titans, they needed to attack that. Uh, they actually went out and, and got a, an atypical player in Braxton Berrios and at pick 210, a slot receiver, white guy. We all know how that works. So we'll see another stud slot receiver in three years once he develops. Um, this Jimmy, they really those, do get the same kind of players, man. This is like their third white slot receiver. <laughs> but they're going to turn into Whether it's Amendola, whether it's Edelman, whether it's Welker, I mean, there was no it, – it, it's bad when you say Bill Belichick was at the University of Miami's uh, pro day and you knew why he was there. He wasn't there for Chad Thomas uh, or he wasn't there for um, any D Delaney or any of the players at Miami that played any other position but wide receiver because they went and got Axton Barrios. They knew what they were going for. Um but another winner for you, I'll leave that. I'll, I don't want to sound, I don't want to make this Patriots draft today. So we're going to, we'll leave that a little bit. Yeah, let's I not do that. that little nugget out. <laughs> so the, when I look at other big time moves, Ozzy Newsome at those pesky Ravens, because every single time I think there is time to bury this team and Ray Lewis is gone and T. Civil is going to be out the door at some point. Alodi Nata is gone and all of these good players are gone. They, Ozzie Newsom says, this is my last year. I'm sitting here like, yes, this is great. They're no longer a problem. Lamar Jackson comes along, and he's been drafted after they trade back into the first round at number 32. And he, it, it makes sense now because you go get RG3, not saying he's a good player, but similar style of player. Joe Flacco's days are numbered. Um, I, I personally wanted Lamar Jackson. I, I thought Lamar Jackson was one of two of the two uh, best quarterbacks. There were only two good ones. Uh, I thought Lamar Jackson and Josh Rosen were the two best in this class. Uh, and it makes sense. You go get similar quarterbacks that do similar things. Joe Flacco is the odd man out. He uh, And you go give him weapons. So this is one that Ozzie Newsom, this will be his legacy pick. So all you Ravens fans, enjoy for the next this, this 10 years. Question, this guy's going to be a stud. Really? And we talked about it beforehand because we we were on the air right before the draft started, and we kind of knew what the situation was going to be. But every time you or any other you know draft analyst talked talks about this before the draft, during the draft, or after the draft, when they name the best quarterbacks in the draft, Baker Mayfield's name doesn't come up. So why, oh why, does the Cleveland Brown select Baker Mayfield with the number one pick. And that leads me to my losers because and <laughs> I'm glad you segued into that. Segue you, into the losers. The, 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 the Cleveland Browns found every single way to there we think trust the process. We'll take your your Philadelphia seventy sixers mantra and say these guys are gonna trust the process. They get all these draft picks, they pass on quarterback year after year. And you say, these guys are going to get it right this time. They're going to get two top five picks. This is unheard of. And then you go take an undersized, not athletic. He doesn't get out the pocket. He's not Russell Wilson. He's not. He, he may, he's not really Drew Brees. He's his own guy. He's, they, they believe in analytics. Sound like, you know, believing in analytics, trusting the process, sound familiar to you? Yeah. Um, they select Baker Mayfield, who doesn't, who doesn't do it for me. He he. He's not. He doesn't have a strong arm. He's a big time personality off the field. He's not a great quarterback, and yet you have a coach like Hugh, like uh, Hugh Jackson, who you he already had Johnny Manziel, and then you're going to go get him a lesser version of him. And then on top of that, you say we got an opportunity after the Giants take a good a running back. Good job, guys. You're next. Um, and then the Jets who take a quarterback in Sam Darnold. Good job, guys. You made it. A, you made a good pick. We're back to the Browns. 
they have an opportunity to take the best pass rusher because the, the job of an NFL team and NFL coach is to have a quarterback and go get after the other, the other team's quarterback. You go take a corner. You go take, take an undersized man-to-man icy corner, but a guy that may not fit here. We've done this already. Johnny Manziel, Justin Gilbert, we've done this already. You had Bradley Chubb sitting right there in front of you to just, just take him, and yet you don't. What are you doing, Cleveland? What are you doing? Yeah, I, I mean, it's just it's just weird, man. I mean, both of the picks, like, people were just dumbfounded because, like you said before, like, you just think at some point that the Cleveland Browns are going to get it right. And <laughs> at this point, nobody really thinks that the Cleveland Browns got the situation correct. Um, I, I see we have callers on the line. Uh, callers, I hope you guys can still hear us because – Actually, the live broadcast has just dropped, so I think everybody's going to have to hear Uh-oh. this um, this uh, broadcast on you know, on the replay. So we're just going to keep going, even though it stopped. Um, so just bear with us, callers, because we're still going to get to you guys if you're there. But I guess the other callers probably won't call in because they, when they tune into the station, they're not going to hear <laughs> anything happening live. But anyway, we're going we're gonna to just – Keep on plugging along. We just got to push the replay real hard later on. Um, so, um, yeah, so so Cleveland basically pulls a Cleveland, and we'll see. I mean, maybe this one will be the one, like, where everybody's like, we can't believe they did it again. Maybe this one will be the one that works out for the franchise, you know, hopefully. But I just I, think I don't, they've when, always God. been in the business of overanalyzing and outthinking themselves when they have, you know, the picks to make a difference right there in front of them. I just don't understand it. But <laughs> I, don't under, I don't understand it either. And quite honestly, when I look at a, a dysfunctional franchise like this, they, you go out and go get a John Dorsey to be your, your savior. And he, you, had, you had a good enough time. You had roughly four months to figure this out, and you still botch it. Good job, good job. I mean, if you're a Brown, if you're a Browns fan, if you we're taking applications over here at the Evil Evil Empire, we'll make you feel good about yourself. We're giving out applications from worst to first. Come on, yeah, one time crazy. only. Crazy, um, crazy stuff. Well, some of the some of the highlights. Um, let me just read off some of the highlights of the draft. Of course, Baker Mayfield was a surprise, number one overall pick. Not surprised, like. When they said the name, because, you know, the number one pick, no matter who it is, it's always going to leak um, 24 hours or so before the draft. Um, Josh Allen still went number seven, despite the racist tweets that resurfaced, you know, living in today's society, the, you, you're not quite sure about this. That, the boatload of picks that the, that the Bills gave up for him. I mean, plus you, you give up your left tackle, you give up three extra picks, then you, you get a quarterback that – wasn't all that great. What are you doing, Buffalo? Right. Uh, what else happened? Uh, Shaquem Griffin is going to play with his brother Shaquille in uh, Seattle. He gets picked. Um, great story there. We all know that story. Ryan Shazier walked out with his fiance to announce the Steelers' first pick, and we also have some uh, Ryan Shazier, Pittsburgh Steelers news that we're going to talk about in, in a little while. Uh, Lamar Jackson, of course, uh, like Fred said, going to the Ravens. Um, I, guess, I guess we could say Flacco's time there is, is numbered. <laughs> Maybe, you know, he sits behind him for a year or two, but I think, yeah, you, you pick him where you picked him. I think they're going to be pretty much ready to move on at some point. So, you know, a lot of stuff happened. Uh, of course, Saquon Barkley did end up going number two to the New York Giants. That might have been the biggest player and pick debate that happened in the weeks and maybe even the months leading up to the NFL draft. So, yeah, a, a lot of things happen, so and, and you have your winners and losers. want to ask you about this one thing, since you got to talk about your Patriots. Um, the Philadelphia Eagles select – a rugby player um, with one of their picks. And 
you show his highlights. I mean, they draft him as a tackle, and you see his highlights, and you think, like, man, this guy could possibly play tight end and get a little, a couple of dump offs, a couple of screens, break some tackles, and do some damage. But is this a a, a, a Super Bowl champion stunting on the rest of the league pick where you're going to spend a pick on somebody who's never even played American football before? I is think this so. a, uh, we just won the bowl and we're loaded, so we're going to pick anybody we want, and our fans don't care this year, so we can do crazy stuff like this type of pick? <laughs> um, when you have it on lower – the Eagles have a, a lot of depth at a lot of different positions. And when you're being able to make pick, you can make luxury picks like this later in the draft. It's not like you're the Cleveland Browns where you're just so bad and you're making luxury picks. <laughs> yeah, you, you're there. You're your Eagles are in a great position to to make these types of picks. Um, if it doesn't work out, we we made a diff, We went out outside the box, and other teams have tried this. So it's not like you guys are the first ones to do it, and it didn't necessarily work out. But it brings a different perspective, and it also brings a, a different type of athlete because um, you're you're always pushing for depth. And if it hits, great. If it doesn't, we didn't waste any real draft capital. And that's how most teams look at it. Um, and you you've seen different sport, different players come from different sports, whether it's Antonio Gates uh, coming from from basketball or Brandon Weeden. He did start a couple games. In the NFL, he had a he had a cup of coffee in the NFL playing baseball. Um, so you, it, it's never anything out of the realm of possibility for a team that's being a contender to uh, to go outside the box like that. All right, so all right, so so moving on because you know, like I said, this is everything we do at this point is speculation because everything right now is literally just. On paper, so we'll see. Baker Mayfield may turn out to be Dan Marino. You never know. Um, doubt it, but you never know. Um, so let's 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 hear your way too early top five NFL draft picks for next season. First off, and this one this one's an easy slam dunk pick. Whoever the whenever the Browns decide to get the number one pick again next year, even despite all of the things that they've had, and Don't they be able to get a Bradley Chubb. Out of it. They'll, they'll, get, they'll be able to get a very nice defensive end. I'm not saying the Browns are going to get the number one pick, but if they are just as bad as I think that quarterback position is going to be, uh, despite the weapons and everything. By the way, they have no Joe Thomas, by the way, so that's going to hurt. But no, if whoever gets this first overall pick, they're going to probably take a prospect uh, by the name of, uh, of Nick Bosa. Now, if that last name sounds very familiar to you, uh, it is very, it's very familiar because his brother has been terrorizing quarterbacks for the last couple of years after holding out uh, from being being a top five pick, uh, Joey Bosa from the uh, Chargers. He this is this is going to be an easy one because simply um, he's a I think he's a little bit better of an athlete than Joey, and that's scary because we all know how good Joey Bosa has been in the last couple of years, and it's going to stand to get paid very very quick. Um, I, I look at. For, for this class, you're going to have – the quarterback class is going to be really, really bad. Um, but I look at a player like a A.J. Brown uh, from Ole Miss. He's 6'1", 225. Uh, I, I look at – I see a lot of uh, – if we remember J, uh, Justin Blackman from Oklahoma State, without the issues, without all the, the drinking and things like that, that's who I see a lot of in him. Big, strong receiver. Ole Miss doesn't necessarily have the quarterback to get it to him, but sometimes when you're just a just a freak athlete like that, it doesn't really matter. Um, I have to give a little bit of love to uh, to the on, on the other side of the ball. Clemson has four, yes, four. You know how they used to say the, the, there was this thing, the four horsemen. Uh, well, Clemson has the four horsemen on on their defensive line. You could put insert. Whoever you want at number three from that defensive line, whether it's Dexter Lawrence, because if you like Vita Vea last year uh, for the for this past draft coming from going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Dexter Lawrence is a defensive tackle who can do a lot of what he does, but he's a better athlete. Uh, whether it's Cleveland Farrell, who has the potential to be a Jadavian Clowney type of player, he's long, athletic, and fast. Uh, you also have Christian Wilkins, who if he came out this year would have been a first-round pick easily. 
and Austin Bryant, who is one of those big run stuffing defensive ends who are get, who's getting a lot better uh, with his hands, and he's going to be a, a, just a monster when it comes to being a pass rusher. Uh, Clemson has a embarrassment of riches uh, on that defensive line, and you know, you know, we can't. I, I'd be remiss to not talk about an Alabama player, Raquan Davis. Uh, from Alabama, defensive tackle, uh, just getting bigger, stronger, faster. Saw him in the spring game, and they confirmed to me he's going to he's going to be one of those guys who's going to be a problem. He's gotten better with his hands, and you can tell the difference. You can really tell. So is he going to be like him. the second Raekwon picked in the past three seasons? <laughs> yes, yes, he will. Um, yes, he will. I'm starting, to, hey, Jimmy. I'm starting to think. You know, the people of our era, you know, having babies <laughs> right after the purple tape came out. Probably, probably big yeah, Raekwon yeah. and Shane and naming their kids Raekwon. And, and Wu Tang is for the chil- Wu Tang is for the children, so you know. Always for the children. <laughs> All right. So how many is that, Fred? That's that's four, and I, I give no love to the quarterback in this coming class because I yeah. I'm sorry, there's nothing, none, zero, not, and never gonna happen. None. Of, there are no quarterbacks in this class that I'm willing to even pull the trigger on in the first round much less in the top five. Uh, somebody might surprise me, but I don't think so. Uh, the, I, I have to go out of, and I have to go out on the field for, for one of my guys uh, from the University of Miami. Uh, University of Miami, this is going to be the year for the defense on the defensive side of the ball. You have multiple players in the secondary. You have multiple players on the defensive line that are going to be out there. But, um, Michael Jackson is going to yes, Michael Jackson along with his his, his co star Joe Jackson on the defensive line. Uh, mm-hmm. Both of those guys. Are gonna have, yeah, all we need is a Tito. I mean, <laughs> come on, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm surprised Jimmy has chirped in on that one, but you know, Michael Jackson from from Alabama of all places, the great state of Alabama of all places, is going to be a problem in the secondary. He is a he's a ball. <laughs> Jimmy's hawk, favorite state. And, <laughs> yeah, so he's from his favorite state, of course. Yeah, um, he's going to be a ball hawk and a big time issue for a lot of teams uh, in the ACC, picking off a lot of passes. Um, this year, the Miami Hurricanes will be a very good defensive team. But those are five players that you'll be able to, to definitely look out for. Um, and, and I probably will expand on that a little bit more because there, this year, this next class is going to be loaded on the defensive side, and if you get, you're going to have your pick of guys whether it's at Alabama, whether it's at uh, Auburn, uh, whether it's at Georgia, whether it's at Georgia uh, just don't look for quarterbacks. This is not the year for quarterbacks. You're going to re- – this is this coming quarterback class reminds me of the year when Christian Ponder came out with Jake Locker. It's going to be ugly. Right, real bad. right. So basically, you know, considering next year – If you needed a – This was, this was if Cleveland's If you needed a quarterback, you should have went one last year. Yeah, and this was this was the, they they bought the right their opportunity. Decision. They could have just made the right choice, but they decided to go with a quarterback who likes to grab his crotch at other men. So we'll see though. In Baker, we trust. So or they trust. I don't. I can't <laughs> wait till he throws about five picks and they pull the pro, pull the plug on the process within the first probably <laughs> game. All right, so there you have it. Uh, NFL draft recap with Fred Purdue and his way too early top five picks for next year. Fred, as usual, man, thanks for your time. Uh, we're going we gonna to get this NFL thing back up and popping, man. I promise you. One of these days. But um, we'll wrap to you next week, all right? All right, guys. Thanks for having me on. All right, no all right Fred. Take it easy. Fred Purdue, everybody. Um, and, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to throw out some stuff on social media. I'm going to go to the Facebook page and let people know they can listen in on the phone. Okay. I saw Tobias was on the line. I was about to let him on, but I don't see him anymore. So I don't know if he gave oh, up because he couldn't man. hear or or what. But I, I yeah, damn be. sure hope we don't record for the next two hours and then this joint tell us that it didn't get it. But that this would actually yeah, have been my bad. I think I put the wrong information in. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're well, anyway, I mean, able to call in. Like, well, well, whether it's recording, I don't know. But you can still call in. Um, I know because – I am, <laughs> but uh, right because I did test from a yeah. from a phone and it's um, I can still hear us. 
So, so maybe, anyway, maybe Master, just, maybe, Master, maybe Master got Tobias, and, you know, that's what really happened, so, you know. Yeah, so if anybody, you know, we'll, we'll throw the message on there, because so, I'm about to make an announcement, but I don't think it matters if nobody's listening on the phone right now. Um, yes, sir. Anyway, though, instead of being pressed to do the, the two, what we'll do, Ken, we'll just, we'll, we'll fly through our, our topics, and then we'll get off just in case this drink was going to kick us off anyway. All right, so. This is true. Um, uh, stat of the week. Uh, LeBron is at it again. His assault on the books uh, is real at this particular juncture, 15 years into his career. Uh, LeBron has surpassed Scottie Pippen for the all-time lead in playoff steals. Pippen held the record with 395 steals. Um, LeBron broke that record in game seven of the series with Indiana, uh, now going into game two with Toronto, which is on live right now, he's up to 400 steals. So like I said, Pippen had 395, which he recorded in 208 playoff games. Uh, LeBron broke the record playing in his 224th playoff game. So most of these records, like a lot of these records, LeBron doesn't get to them faster than some of the guys who held them. Mm -hmm. But with him, and with guys of his generation, since, you know, he was in that high school straight to the NBA phase, they start to do a lot of age statistics. So, of course, he's probably the youngest player to do it. Um, but shout out to yeah. him for you breaking know, it's, another it's, record. It's a couple things about it. So he doesn't get there faster and all that, and they do have the age uh, thing. But, you know, why it's a credit to LeBron still is because um, it also shows that LeBron – doesn't miss the playoffs. Like, he doesn't no. miss the playoffs at all. He doesn't go out in the first round. So, um, but... It's like it took him a couple the, of years to make the playoffs, but he's been in ever since. Once he did... And like you said, hasn't he lost like, in the first round. <laughs> he was like, I like... He went to a restaurant. It took him a long time to get there. But once he get there, he enjoyed the food and was like, I'm coming back. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I'm going to keep going. This, you know what, you know what I mean? mean? I'm going to keep coming yeah. in. So, salute to him for that. And I, and I agree... When I look at the way the game is played now, and I look at some of these records, it's like, man, we're in a, we're in a day and time where um, possessions are up, um, the shooting is is just, you know, the three point shot, those stats are going to be obliterated. Um, yeah. You know, so it, we're, we're, it's, it's interesting time, man. Hashtag with a time to be alive, man. You know. Now that one, Jim, but, that point that you brought up about the three point shot, that's the one that bothers me a little bit like everything else like records are, are made to be broken even three-point records it's just mm-hmm. that the way that the three-point shot is damn near the primary focus of the game these days it's yeah. just gonna make some very good players some specialists it's just gonna you know they're gonna be buried in history man nobody gonna be checking for dale ellis <laughs> dale curry um, mm-hmm. Like I said, Reggie's lucky enough to 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 have been more than a three point shooter, so you're never going to forget about Reggie Miller. But you know, Craig Hodges, yeah, the yeah. league wants you to forget about him anyway. So <laughs> if mm-hmm. Steve Kerr wasn't on the bench of one of the greatest um, runs in NBA history, he would be forgotten as a player. So it, it's just a lot of guys out there. Like I was looking, just you know, doing NBA history stuff earlier in the week and just a lot of guys came up I'm like oh, I remember him he just stroked the three but it's like everybody mm-hmm. strokes the three now like your your yep. worst player might <laughs> your worst player in the rotation you know who gets in the game might hit two or three three pointers a night now because teams are taking it's because 37 yeah, to 53 pointers per game and but it also go, also shows you the growth of the game too in a way that because all players are not now. Don't take this the wrong way for those listening. I don't want Joel calling me because he takes things literal. But the the players now, <laughs> although he may agree with this because he's all about bashing the old players. But the players now are more well rounded. There's lot. There's a lot less yeah. specialists. Right. The specialists are gone. Like they're, they're like even the guys now who grab rebounds still will throw that three up on you. Like you know what I mean. Right. So the, the, but the you know overall what, Jim? game has changed. The people who bash the old days they would say that as a compliment to today's players. And it is a compliment, but at the same time, I would think if that wasn't a fact of today's players, then they would be failing because everything evolves. So if you don't take everything you saw 
combine it and build on it and make the game quote unquote better, then they would be failing if they didn't do that. That's why it's so hard to compare players over different eras because it definitely the is. game is just played diff- way different now. Like I'm looking at the monitor right now as we speak and I'm looking at things that, that they're calling. I'm like, really? That's an offensive foul. Like, like some things. Like, it's a, it's a complete different game. It's a complete different right. game. People used to get mauled and it, but it's just a complete different game. Like it really is. Right. But even without the mauling, some of the stuff they call now is like, come on. Like, you don't even have to say basketball used to be a man's game. Like, come on. They, like, you just shouldn't call that, period. <laughs> like, it, it don't even have anything to do with the past errors being so physical. Like, some things you just shouldn't call. But, um, <laughs> yeah, the, the three-point shot is just – it's it's the game now. And mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> it's, it's crazy how the game has evolved because there was a point, I'd say, between five and ten years ago, when the game was going this way. But to me, it seemed like everybody was just chucking up threes, but no one could shoot. Now, you mm-hmm. know, percentages are going up. Dudes that you don't even know are stroking the three. You know, you're like, man, that was a nice shot. Who the hell is dude? <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird time. Like you said, what a time to be alive, man. What a time to be alive. But back to LeBron, yeah. um, to, to bring some perspective on the guys that he passed. I've already said Pippen at 395. Um, of course, Michael Jordan's up there at 376. And Magic Johnson, uh, fourth on the list at 358. So, again, shout out to LeBron for his assault on the NBA record books. And the way he's playing now mm-hmm. and the fact that he's never been seriously injured, like he's going to put a lot of this stuff well out of reach until some other cyborg comes along in the future to even try to challenge some of his records. So. I mean, when yeah, he's said and done, I think this GOAT argument is going to be 100% legit. My only beef in the whole thing is, like, just be patient. Like, let it play out. <laughs> because the dude has a lot of years ahead of him, you know, if he feels like it. Even though, you know, once he hit a billy, he might just call it quits. <laughs> and, and that could be, like, any day now. So, you know, no. Yeah, and, and the, but the thing about it is, it's like, that's kind of like, what keeps me from the whole online sports argument thing, like y'all killed that. And that's what everybody listening. Um, Mm -hmm. You guys have destroyed that because every, and it's kind of like the conversation you were having the other day with Joel. It's like the next guy that comes around, they're going to anoint him right away. And it's going to be disrespectful to LeBron because that's just the way things are now. It's like, yo, we have, we we feel like the the need to constantly anoint someone the greatest, or this has to be the best. It's like, yo, Bill Walton is really taking over. And right, I just find right, it hilarious right. when Bill Walton did it because it was like a shtick. But, yo, that's no, like <laughs> people really do that. Yeah, you, you like, know, said really me something it. earlier, and I was like, yo, everybody's just shock jocking now. Like if somebody gets good – oh, yeah, so uh, uh, Kane from ESPN was talking about uh, Brad Stevens. And I think – I've said it to people. I've said it to you. Like, yeah, I think <clears throat> young Brad Stevens is one of the best coaches – in the NBA right now. I'm very impressed with, mm-hmm. what, he does, with what he does. And then you get mm-hmm. Kane to say, well, if I was to do a redraft of the entire league right now, there's only eight players in the league that I'd take before Brad Stevens. Right, come on now. People still got to be well, on and, the court and, 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 the game. And, 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 part, and part of that is, part of, part of that is the 24-7 news cycle and with so much sports radio. Like, there's literally – Right now, um, and salute to all of our people that listen to us and they want us to listen to us because there is literally several million sports podcasts available, right? So when you add that into the mix with everything on YouTube and then you add that to the mix with ESPN and then Fox having 24-7 sports, people try to differentiate themselves. So the hosts run out of things to talk about. So they literally would just make up some, like, you know, um, uh, how would Kanye put it, poopity scoop or some scoopity poop. They'll make it up. They'll make up some poopity scoop just just so they can like you know have something different to talk about, which is which also to me ruins everything because I don't even think people will leave some of the stuff they say. Nah, they they don't, and you know especially shows when you have a, a two man team going back and forth. Like I've always been of the opinion that these dudes just say stuff. One of them has to take this position. The other one has to take that position. They probably talk before the show to see who's going to be good cop, bad cop, and they just say things. Mm-hmm. 
and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I, I really don't think that dudes believe everything that they say when they when they say the things that they say. So mm-hmm. it, we, we living in a shock job time in society right now. You got the cow herds of the world. He has to say something shocking every single episode, and he does it every day. So you you can un- understand. You know, you run out of context. You got to say stuff to keep people listening. So sometimes yeah, shout out to Howard Stern because. <laughs> Shout out to Howard Stern because that's his. That's his. He's a legend. That's his effect on this industry. Is uh, a <laughs> the whole shock jock thing because you know. But anyway, yeah. So I mean, you know, we'll see what LeBron does as time goes on. He's going to obliterate every record because it doesn't look like he's slowing down. And with him like switching teams whenever he feels like it. Right. <laughs> LeBron is like he his own legacy. Like I'll do what I want right now. <laughs> This ain't yeah, working like out. You said, I, I'm, I'm a few chips short. Let me go, go over here. But it, that goes to something you said. You was like, if you don't improve on the pass, then something's wrong with you. So what they yeah. what they decided was part of that improving in their eyes is like, yo, I just get out whenever I want to. Right. Like, I don't have to stay here and wrestle for championships. <laughs> and the crazy like, the crazy part is a lot, a lot of that is because of how players were treated in the past. So they almost have nobody to blame but themselves. Because when you hear stories of the past and like the NBA, like specifically like a lot of the stories mentioned in that book, the uh, Forty Million Dollar Slaves, when you hear a lot mm. of the stories of things that went on behind the scenes, it kind of sheds light into why the players act like this. Because you know um, a lot of the collusion and shot to the NFL, we're still getting accused of collusion in 2018. A lot of the collusion and things that went into play to kind of control the players' life. Now it's like, yo, we got out. Watch this. It, it, it went a little bit too far. Anyway, we're getting way yeah. off on a tangent. <laughs> we always do. It's supposed That's to be about LeBron. It. It's supposed to be about LeBron. It's supposed to be about LeBron getting steals. <laughs> All right. So again, shout out to LeBron. And I'm I'm stalling a little bit anyway, so that was all good because I'm sitting here trying to put these uh these messages out, telling everybody that they can listen by phone. All right. So um, real quick, you guys, as usual, you know, you can check out our website at worldroomsports.com. While you're browsing the site, take your time, look around, click on the Contact Us tab to send us a message about our company, the show, to inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities, um, or if you just want to buy us million-dollar equipment so we don't have to do this anymore, or join the network, whatever. For general answers, <laughs> email us at worldroomsports.com. While you're browsing the site, click on the memorabilia tab. Buy yourself some World Room Sports merchandise. Click the blog tab to read our latest articles on the All's Fair and Sports and War blog. Shout out to Gus Griffin, who's been holding that down lately. He has his latest blog in there on uh, the NFL draft and and the crapshoot that is the NFL draft every year. So go to the site and check that out. You can also click the respective icons and tabs to follow all our social media platforms to subscribe to our iTunes podcast or watch our webcast at War Room Sports TV and to download our free War Room Sports mobile app on Android or iOS to get everything I just mentioned on the go. Join the JW Philly Realty chat room right now during the show. As a matter of fact, you might not be able to do this, but you can try. Blogtalkradio.com slash the War Room to enter the chat room. Sign up for a free profile profile on Blog Talk Radio if you don't want to create an account. If you don't have to, you can sign up to your Facebook and Twitter accounts so while you're at it. Make sure you click follow because that'll get you updates and reminders about the show every week. We'll be taking questions, reading posts from Facebook, Twitter, chat room, War Room Sports Game Time group on the Group Me app, all of that during the show. If you want to call in and speak with us, hopefully you're already on the line for my messages. The Digital Stream Hot Technologies Hotline is 323-410-0012. Press 1 when prompted. If you're already listening from your phone, just press 1 if you want to holler at us. So we're going to talk a little bit about what happened this week while you good folks were on that grind out there in the world, hustling, grinding, doing whatever you do to support yourself and your family. We salute that. This is what happened during that time. And while you're on the grind of you by Sports to Book, you guys tired of reading the same old sports books with the same lists, rankings, imaginary starting lineups, all that BS. Well, be sure to pick up your copy of Sports. Smart people only read the sports. It's a mixture of sports, hip-hop culture, and a comedic aspect that you will definitely, definitely love. So just go to sportsthebook.com or you can get your copy from the hub, worldroomsports.com, wherever you get it from. Just make sure you don't miss the movement. 
All right, man, this is close to home, Jim. A football coach, um, and this coach is at Camden Catholic, basically East Philadelphia, right across the bridge in Camden, New Jersey. Um, he claims he's being fired for having too many black players on the football team. Uh, again, yes, this is 2018 that you guys are listening to this. You're not gathered around the radio <laughs> in 1946 listening to your favorite uh, programming before televisions were invented. Um, the coach is a white guy. Uh, his name is Nick Strong. Uh, he's he's a, a football coach, a golf coach, and I believe a history teacher um, at Camden Catholic. So he basically has been asked to resign from his position. His contract isn't even going to be picked up for being a teacher in the school next year. So he's come out to the media and said, basically, and this is a quote from him from day one, the administration told me they did not approve of the ratio of black to white students. Uh, then he said he estimated the topic of race came up 10 to 20 times um, with the president of the school. He said, when I'd have a list of potential freshmen, the first question I'd be asked is if they were white or black. I was confused about why the question was, how can we get more white players in the program or on the field? Uh, the school has come out and said it's absolutely preposterous. The claims that he's making, um, everything will, in fact, be investigated. But they, they, you know, they claim that they stick by the fact that the school has never had any issues with racism. And this is totally preposterous. Now, we have somebody close to the program because one of our uh, War Room Sports generals, one of the co-founders of War Room Sports, Doc Bayon, he didn't go to Camden Catholic, but he did go to Camden, um, you know, the public high school and play basketball and football there. And he said even since back then and in our time, back in the early to mid-90s, Camden Catholic has always had this type of reputation. So I'm not really well versed on that. I don't know if you are, Jimmy, but what are your thoughts on this situation? Man, um, it's funny because it's one of those things toilet. where – <laughs> it, it, it's, it's funny because this is 2018 and shout out to your, those listening in 2058. This was still going on in 2018. Um, right now, everybody probably, um, everybody's probably mixed. If you listen to this in 2048, you know what I mean? All y'all look like uh, Tony Parker and Drake, but um, <laughs> back in 2018, this was still going on. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's crazy because on one hand it's like, uh, I have so many emotions when I hear the story because, first of all, why are your black kids going to that Catholic school anyway? But that's either here nor there. Let's just say he's telling <laughs> the truth. If he's, tell, if he's telling the Especially truth. after everything we um, know about Catholic priests. If he's, te- if he's telling the truth, you're really not being an honorable dude anyway because why are you just saying it now when they canned your ass? Like, if you felt some type right. of way about right. it. Oh, my God. Great point. Say something, when, <laughs> say something when it's happening, B. Like, you wait till you get canned. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? You, 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 you. <laughs> So my thing is, you're not really a hero if that's the the angle you're trying to play. Because if you was a hero, you'd have been came out and got you, you know, said what you had to say. So you was okay with them questioning it until they got rid of you. Yeah, all right. Yeah. To the school, I hope every to black player like word, me. But I've been clocking this story for like a week, and I did not want to think about that aspect of the situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, they don't... They got if they did it ten to twenty times throughout the years. Not saying something about it, you're basically just worried about, you, you know, them stopping your potential to make a living at this particular moment because you damn sure didn't care. Pretty much the last ten or twenty times they said something to you about. Yeah, so even if it is true, you co-signed it until your job was at stake. So come on, cuz. And um, right. you know, this is just another. This is another reason I'll add to the list of why uh, you know, places like Ivy Leaf, which is near and dear to us, are so needed in 2018. Um. We need institutions of our own, so we don't even have to worry about this. You don't want us to yeah. play for you. Cool. We'll play against you and then kill you. That's not literal. We definitely literal. need That's Ivy like, Lease to teach our kids so, you know, 30 years later our kids can go to administrators from school. Shout out to the homie. Um, <laughs> but anyway, no, that that's a great point. I mean, obviously, they still didn't like his, his ratio, so he he still did something, you know, as far as – getting more black kids than they would like. But, yeah, you're damn sure not a hero if you wait to speak on this, you know, 
years later when they finally actually mm-hmm. resign. <laughs> so shout yep. out to the to the <laughs> to the first fact that he even got these kids, but that all of that was in an attempt to win. You know, his high school record was on the line as well. So yeah, he ain't not yeah. really a hero. Jimmy took one sentence for me to change my whole outlook on this bull. <laughs> <laughs> he, he corny. Forget this dude. Let's move on. All right. So um, the Steelers, um, and we talked about it earlier. Ryan Shazier walked, mind you, he walked out onto the stage with his fiance. And you guys out there know how big that is. If you understand the scope of his in- his injury, one of those injuries where you're not sure that you'll ever walk again. He walked down onto the stage with his fiance to introduce the Steelers' first pick. The Steelers have basically just hooked him up with some good faith act, and they converted his $8.26 million base salary for next year into a signing bonus, which means he gets that money now up front. And we, like I said, not knowing if he's ever going to again. So basically it was base salary and it was already guaranteed. So it was money that the guy was going to get anyway, but it was kind of, you know, even if he wasn't playing, I assume that was going to be, you know, weekly checks or however they get paid in the NFL. Yeah. Like he, you know, if he was playing, he would have got it in checks, but they're giving it to him all up front. Um, even though it was money they were on the hook for anyway, the gesture is kind of cool because going through what he's going through, you know, it's, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's nice for his family to have a nice chunk of change up front. Um, again, kind of like the story that we just said, like it's not as heroic as it seems on the surface. <laughs> but mm-hmm. Shout out to the Steelers for for doing it anyway. What, what, what Yo, shout out, shout out to uh, shout out to Jim Rocasso because as soon as I saw the story, I thought about him, and I was like, oh mm-hmm. god, he's gonna find another. This is add to the list of the reasons why he uh, gives the whole franchise blumpkin. But um, <laughs> salute to him. Uh, you know it is a good gesture and it's good PR too. So you know, ain't nothing right, wrong. Right. You know what I mean? You gotta. And that's the thing. Uh, it, uh, they can get this good PR without like it's not like it's not costing them any extra money. I mean, the Steelers have exactly. eight million laying around. They can give them his cash now. So it's, it's definitely a good PR move for somebody who probably has a family who could use the money up front for now. But this is just telling mm-hmm. you know this is the Steelers putting it out there like. All right, we're doing this good gesture, but when we cut your ass <laughs> in a little while, <laughs> we don't want everybody to get upset with us because we did this. So that too. look out for that in the in the, in the coming months uh, or whatever. But um, yeah. So shout out to the Steelers and shout out to Ryan Shazier and his recovery from an absolutely horrific injury. Now we men- mentioned a little while ago how LeBron probably has a good five years of prime left unless, you know, he wants to roll out, you know, when he becomes a billionaire. And that time is fast approaching. Um, LeBron James and his $6.5 million investment in Liverpool, the soccer club, uh, it's worth five times that now. So (laughs) when he initially did it in 2011, he received a 2% stake of the Historic English Club. And like I said a second ago, that was $6.5 million. It's now approximately worth $32 million. So this is another great day in the valuation of one LeBron, Raymond James, just another kid from Akron that we get to witness every day. You see, I threw Yo, in LeBron, all the cliches from his career in one sentence. Bars. Uh, you definitely <laughs> did. But yo, here's the crazy part, man. I was, I was um, watching um, I was watching Ellen, and whoever laughs at that, you could judge your mother. But um, <laughs> the, funny, the, boy, the boy, the from uh, the boy from the um, oh, you got so many tragedies and mass shootings now. Um, the Waffle House joint, uh, was on there, and um. Ellen, you know, basically found out that his favorite athlete of all time was D-Wade. And, you know, she brought out D-Wade and, uh, you know, the whole thing, the whole uh, teary-eyed moment thing. He met, his, he met his hero. But she asked him before she brought out D-Wade, she was like, why is D-Wade your favorite player of all time? And he was like, really, it's not basketball. It's how he carries himself off the court. Um, right. 
you know, I automatically went to the fact that he got Gabby. That's what he do off the court. But anyway, well, so I was sitting there <laughs> thinking about that. I was like, so, I was like, so, who is my favorite player if I had to judge him based upon what they do off the court? And LeBron might be that guy. I mean, Ali's no longer with us, but let's just say living athlete. I'm about to say, LeBron is, might be that like, guy. Who else could it be? But, but but to your point of what you said earlier, LeBron, you know, sat around after MJ, did, you know, um, who is an example yeah. of what not to do. Uh, who he saw, you know, he, he's a, he's a uh, student of history according to everybody who's around him. So he saw what Ali went through, um, and saw what Kobe went through the whole nine. So he had, he had all that. He's on their shoulders. But at the same time, when you look at what he's done in terms of empowering his friends. He turned the whole posse thing on, up on his head. Like every player before him, that was a detriment. He made it. He, he made it an asset. When you look at what he does philanthropically, when you look at what he does from a social standpoint, and you know, add all those things together, he's probably my favorite off the uh, court floor player. And I could do nothing but salute him for that. And also the fact that he takes his business serious. Like right. I made a joke before that LeBron has been on the, uh, the cover of Fortune and Forbes just as many times he has Sports Illustrated or ESPN the magazine. So he's really about that life. So um, I saw this story and I just laughed. Like that's another thing to add to the list. Like you said. So, so I, LeBron, I agree, um, man. For for all of those yeah, factors, so, man. He, he's taken the business that Jordan. And Magic Johnson, Magic more so after his career, but he's taken Mm -hmm. what those guys have done, put it together, doing it more while he's on the court. Like you said, he gives back, he speaks out, he's empowered his friends. Um, Like, what can you, what is there not to like about what he does off the court? I mean, there's really nothing not to like about what he does on the court, but people are going to keep finding reasons to dislike that kind of stuff too but at Yo, the, at the same it's time, crazy like, right <laughs> because like the one thing is like so i sit back and i'm somewhere in the middle right so you know, the lebron stands are ridiculous but the lebron haters are just as ridiculous and as an observer like a lot I, you know I, I won't spend as much time on social media but i'm still on social media but most of the time it's just reading and laughing at commentary and the reason mm-hmm. it's funny to me is because this dude is literally playing against ghosts it's to the point where it doesn't matter whether he's playing the Raptors. It doesn't matter, like, you know, um, who's in front of him as an opposition. It's like every night is, yeah. is, what is how does this compare to what MJ did? It's not even about exactly. the game in front of him anymore. It's kind of weird. Every like, bucket crazy. he makes, every bucket he makes, LeBron stands, find a reason to crap on MJ. Every bucket he misses, MJ stands, find a reason to crap on LeBron. It's it's very tiring for me because you know I try to engage, but yeah 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 yeah. You get tired of talking about the same thing every day, and I've asked several people, several friends of ours lately in conversations, like yo, can we celebrate something LeBron did without crapping on MJ or Kobe? Because those are always the targets, you know. <laughs> There's always mm-hmm. MJ or Kobe, and then then the same thing. Like if LeBron does something wrong. Like, can you guys not just jump out of your hole and say, Mike would have never done that. Kobe would have never done that. Like, it gets <laughs> tiring. And the fact that a lot of Michael Jordan stands say things like, LeBron is nowhere near Mike. He'll never be Mike. The fact that you have to do that every time LeBron makes a game-winning shot or does something good shows that you're threatened. It shows that you really do think yeah. he's close if you really yeah. don't think. You know, it, it shows that there's something that you're never going to admit that you may know in your mind. So, you know, yeah, don't sit here does, and tell me it's like, he's it's like nowhere dog. near him, but you bring Mike up every time LeBron Yeah, when Durant makes a bucket, when Durant makes a bucket, <laughs> it's never that argument. Like, it just isn't. And that's no shot <laughs> right, Durant. I'm just saying, like, the, yeah, fa- yeah, the yeah. fact of the matter is, yeah, that's not, a, that's not, you know, so a lot of that, that's a great point. And I think I'm going to use your point from now on when people start talking trash. I'm like, so why would you even bring him that's up? Right. If he's not on his right. level, why you bring him up? Why you even bring him up? <laughs> Why wow. every you time this man do admit. something, you gotta bring Mike up. They are threatened, man, and and that's the thing. And 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 we like people like us even get a bad rap depending on who we're talking to, because yeah. if we're I've if, been called if we're saying called something both. objectively critical of LeBron in a room full of LeBron stands, like I have people who think I'm a LeBron hater because I said something yeah. objectively critical to people who think he walks on water. I have people who think I'm a LeBron lover because I said something objectively um, 
you know, praiseworthy of something he did in a room full of LeBron haters. So it's funny how you can be yeah. both to two different groups of people. LeBron does yeah, this to people. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in sports. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> it depends upon who you talk to. <laughs> Live. So, yeah, that, yeah that's, that's crazy, right. man. But shout out to him. Another investment that's going to put him closer to being, you know, the greatest athlete entrepreneur that we've ever seen. Uh, something we got to talk about, man. Not really, It's not sports related at all, but this is our show and we do what we want. Kanye West has been in the news. We talked about him last week because everybody was upset at some of the stuff he was saying. And, you know, he had on had the picture with the MAGA hat and all of that kind of stuff. But this week he took it a step further, saying in an interview with TMZ, which was a very, you know, exciting and intriguing 30 minutes of, of, of footage. Um, he said that slavery was a choice. And he, the context behind it, he was basically saying – it it was it lasted 400 years, you know. Black people were so big in numbers. He was like the fact that basically he's trying to say the fact that we stayed in bondage for 400 years when you know we had those kind of numbers that it had to be a choice. Now, in some things, I mean, because you always have the Harriet Tubman uh, quote that you can that you can conjure up. You know, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more only if they knew that they were slaves. Of course, within that time, you had a a, a part of the slave population who had developed Stockholm Syndrome. And this is the only life that they'd known. So it probably didn't feel so bad to them as it did to the first generation of slaves who were captured, taken from their land, stripped of their religion, stripped of their family. You know what I'm saying? After a while, mm-hmm. as the generations go down and you're born into this and this is all you know, then there's a point to be made for that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because yeah. I, I refuse, you know, I know different stories of slavery. All stories of slavery aren't violence and all of that kind of stuff because, frankly, everybody didn't try to leave so everybody didn't get beat down on a regular basis. Yeah. However... Yeah, it was still slavery, and you know we have people that's going against what Kanye said. We got people that's, you know, on his side. Like a lot of people told him this week, you don't realize how powerful your voice is, and that's true, because there's a lot of people defending yeah. everything Ye has done this week, and and I'm sure you probably can agree on this as well. The the MAGA hat, whoever he supports politically, like I can care less about any of that. Like, black people, yeah. first of all, have to get off this stuff that everybody that's not a Democrat is a coon. You know what I'm saying? Even though a lot of mm-hmm. us think that Donald Trump doesn't represent the best interests of our people, if he wants to be a Donald Trump fan, okay, that's fine. Like, that alone, if I was like this big yay stand, that alone would not make me stop listening to Kanye West's records. Yeah. And even the way he looks at the world, like, I can separate... Kanye and his music from Kanye and maybe the mental problems that he might have. If he thinks slavery was a choice, if he likes Donald Trump, okay, if his album is a, is a banger, I can separate the two. Like now, there may yeah. be more egregious things that he can do, like pedophilia, shout out to R. Kelly, you know, <laughs> st- stuff like that, where, okay, maybe I don't want to separate the artist from the stuff that he does because I got daughters now. I got to look at that kind of stuff. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of things you compartmentalize unfairly by your own situation. It's hard to jump out of your own little box. But a lot of this stuff, like, you know, people just not banging with him musically, you know, this is what they claim anymore because of the stuff he said. I mean, he said some crazy stuff, but yeah, I think I mean, we can uh, separate personally, too. Personally, I'm just glad I don't have a hero complex where as though, like, his words affect right. me the way that I've seen it affect other people care. because I've seen people literally, like, in tears, like, upset. And part of the reason why is because of what he's, like, se- seemingly morphed into. Um, I think the first thing about this whole story is, like, we we need to not – our, our our obsession with celebrity in this country is weird. Like when you travel around the world, mm-hmm. you recognize that our obsession is not this. Like all countries aren't obsessed the way we are with celebrity. They're right. just not um, because there are more important things in life. Now I'm not sitting there saying that you can't worry about this and that because I love ratchetness and I love righteousness. 
Like, um, you know, I'll sit and, and read books. Everyone knows I read books, but I also read. I also watch Real Housewives of Atlanta and Love and Hip Hop New York. You can judge your mother. So, but the I thing just is, finished so watching I, Love and Hip Hop right before we got on the air. Shout out to Stevie J and Escalator's no, so, Rack. So, so, <laughs> yo, so my point in saying that is. Um, I like the madness just as much as the rest, but at the same time, I recognize what it is. It doesn't consume my life like I see it doing some people. Um, it's entertainment, and then, you know, I, I, I know how to comp- compartmentalize. Let's put it that way. Um, he seems to be really going through something mentally, and the, the thing that bothers me the most about all of this is, like, when you really listen to him, right, he talks about not reading. He talks about not knowing what's going on, but – then he talks about free thought. Like, how is it free thought if you're not even, like, what are you? You're not gathering you're not any even, information. You're not <laughs> gathering information. So it's like he, he's, a, he's a constant contradiction. And I think that he's an attention freak to the point mm-hmm. where it's like in 2018, we always talk about people and their need for attention. Attention is a new drug. So I think that he's willing to say and do anything to get that attention he desires because he's been the talked about thing on every platform, good, bad, or ugly. Um, I think if everybody, let's just say for argument, say everybody band together and say, hey, listen, we're not even going to talk about Kanye. I think he might really murk himself. Right. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of sad, but it's interesting. But it also reminds me a lot of Michael Jackson because a lot of times people forget about some of the episodes Michael Jackson had where. Um, like the time he was in Harlem, like dancing on cards with Al Sharpton, which was like mad weird. He had a lot of weird yeah. moments like that too, where he would be seen like seem to be going through something real crazy. But the thing about it is, um, and there's an excellent book on Michael Jackson called Michael Jackson Inc. And it talks about Michael Jackson's business savvy and how he was one of the more forward thinking artists. And a lot of that stuff that Mike seemed to be crazy at the time was all planned. And Mike would say, Listen, there's money in people thinking I'm crazy. Like Michael literally thought that people thinking I'm crazy can make me revenue, and I need this revenue because my monthly bills is high because I want to live with um, apes and, and and live on a Neverland ranch. So and that's a great um, point because I believe Kanye is there as well. You said, Jim, that in our country, like we put way too much on our love for celebrities. You know what the biggest part of that is? I think mm-hmm. when when people like Kanye come along, people like Michael Jackson come along, anybody, people like Bill Belichick come along. We like to throw around the term genius. We call everybody a genius, good at their craft. And people like Kanye, I believe, you know, he hears that. He takes that to heart. Kanye knows that a lot of people in the past who were considered geniuses were quirky, kind of weird. So I think just like Mm -hmm. you're saying, Michael Jackson knew that he had to do a certain amount of crazy for revenue. I think Kanye is there. He's like, yeah, well, I'm, they're going to call me a genius, and I'm going to act like the perceived notion of, of what a genius is. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to be weird. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to be abstract. I'm going I'm to I'm say all kinds of things and dress a certain way and look a certain way. So I think that really gets to him, the fact that people call him a genius because, you know, he's nice with an 808 machine. Um, I personally <laughs> – he's also, he's also somebody no, that's obsessed ahead. with his legacy. He's one of the only mm-hmm. artists that constantly talks about where he ranks in his legacy. And, right. and he's you compared know, himself to the thing. leaders in every industry. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. Anybody white. But, uh, Job. Yeah, and all, you yeah, know, all so, white people. Jobs, Walt Disney. Yeah. Um, everybody. Speaking of that, yeah, Jim, yeah, did that you notice the, during that TMZ yeah. interview, he kind of shut the black dude down and said, I only want to answer questions from Harvey? Uh, yeah, I did. It's it's a lot of things that when you put them all together, it makes you wonder, like, is he always wanted to be a white man? Like, when you start – see, because when you go on rants like this, and it may, kind of, like, makes you rethink everything. But it also is interesting to me is it also shows how much uh, social capital he's built up with our community because um, some of the stuff that he's saying, if anybody – let's just say for argument's sake, um, the legend Bow Wow said some of this stuff. And he actually <laughs> tweeted about this. Bow Wow said, if I said this, it would have killed me already. Like, but that shows you – the kind of social capital that he's already built up. He got so much in the bank right now that um, it's taking a long time for us to dismiss him. Um, and we have this whole thing with, with everybody having an opinion online now. There's this whole movement of people who just want to be contrarians for the sake of being contrarians. So <laughs> what I recognize about it, – it's funny because, like, I spend so much time online over the last decade, like, on every social media site there is I've used. 
and I'm kind of like taking a step back now, and 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 it's because everybody's on there. And it's to the point now we had a family event. I was at a family event this past week. Um, um, my cousin, her daughter had a birthday party, and it was a bunch of a family over the house. And people are sitting around talking about. Did you see what such and such posted here? Like people are sitting around talking about online. That's the news. Right, it's not. Yo, and it's, it's, it's not even. It, did you see so this weird. on the news? Did you see somebody post it? Yeah, it, it was so weird for me. But what I under, what I've like come to understand is like, yo, at one part, part of it is real, a part of it isn't real because so many people just like to to engage to the point where I don't even like. It's hard to argue online anymore because I don't even know if people believe what they're saying. Like I legit believe that half of the people don't believe what they're saying. But the fact of the matter is most people are lonely and have low self-esteem, so they have the need for the constant, the constant like, you know, um, friction or debate or argument, which is cool. But I understand that because I, it's funny because um, shout out to our brother Lamont who literally like just disappeared off everything. I'm still, I'm still mm-hmm. more active than he is. Um, but me and him had a conversation about this, and he was like, yo, he'd be like ready to like pull up on somebody. And it, a lot of that started with, um, with Trump. So when Trump was elected, right. a lot of the MAGA people, he would, like, try to go back and forth and have logical debates with him, and yeah, they would, like, bother him to the point where he was he was making himself sick. So he's like, yo, I'm just going to get off because I'm ready to pull up at people's jobs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yo, what I recognize is <laughs> it's not even real. People don't even believe what they're saying. You know what I'm saying? So, and, and that's what's interesting about So now even our celebrities are just out there talking for the attention. And I don't even know if he believes how that stuff he's saying, but even if he does – um. Everybody who's talked to him says it doesn't seem to be coming from like a um, a nasty place, but he's really clueless. Right. It's like, come from an un- uninformed man, place. Yo, and my he man feels moved to the need, and Jim. fell off the earth. Right, right. And, and and when you have a project coming out, you say to yourself, "Well, it's time for me to get back to social media and create a buzz." So, so let me get on here, say something crazy. Now the whole world is talking about Kanye and his album. What, you know what I'm saying? Whether or not what, you know whether he's saying scoopy poop or not. <laughs> it's going to be the most popular thing in the world. And, I, and I've seen people defend the scoopity poop. But what I find interesting, though, in all this, what I find interesting in all this is that um, he's built up a buzz, no doubt. I mean, it's to the point where, like our brother Akil was saying, they're talking about him. Akil right now is overseas, um, you know, putting in his he's work. Great. To him for the work he's doing overseas. He's talking about this man on Al Jazeera. Right he's still <laughs> talking about Kanye on TV in Kuwait. And, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy, but my thing is your album comes out a month from now. Are you going to, like, move the release date up? Because how do you, how do you sustain it? Right. How do you sustain uh, exactly. it? Because of, like, you, well, you see how quickly he puts out songs. He and T.I. did a song. He put that out in less than 24 hours. Yeah. So he might be on his move-up joint right now. Yeah, he might have to move but, um, that up. Like, it, it, but and it's funny because his, his behavior is so erratic. Like, I was telling you guys yesterday, like, Someone put me down, like, yo, go on his Twitter. This boy is just out here, like, tweeting pictures of sea turtles all day. Like, yo. <laughs> he, because he got to stay in the public eye until he gets yeah. this album out. But look, Jim, I'm like, like yeah, that's probably why he did it. Yeah. Even with the, like you said, there's people out there defending the Scoopity Poop song, right? But mm-hmm. that's the thing. That was his point. Those are the people that he's trying mm-hmm. to play out by doing that. Like, he's yeah, just the yeah. only dude that's cocky enough to, to say it, even though he didn't directly say it. But how many times have we said that about Jay? We, we, we said that about a lot of Jay stands years ago. Like, yo, Jay has gotten to mm-hmm. a point with some of y'all where he can get on the track and fart, and y'all will say it's the hottest stuff y'all have ever heard. Mm-hmm. Kanye just you know went out and about said, that? I'm going to take you, I'm going to do you one further, and I'm going to prove it. I'm going to say scoopity poop on a record, and people are going to defend it. I ain't gonna front. The beat was pounding. Yo, but, when I first heard it, I was like, uh-oh, uh-oh, here we go, here right. we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was kind of interesting. But scoopity poop, poop, scoopity boop. And then yeah, ask T.I. seriously if I should throw in a boop, boop. <laughs> <laughs> Yo! <laughs> he asked him seriously, like, on this part, should I throw in a boop, boop? See, I was like, man, if you don't get the... <laughs> <laughs> yo, and I ain't gonna front. Like, also, man, that song with him and Ti, I love that jump. <laughs> yo, and here's my thing too, man. Like sometimes, right? Um, if someone can tell a lie so long that it becomes the truth in their head, so I, a part of me wonders wh- whether, like, he's been having a stick with this whole like eccentric crazy thing that he actually became that. I 